You guys don't mind me keeping my feet up, it's not disrespecting you, mashallah, hadarat and shuyukh and shuyukhat over here, right? Is that fine? Alright, I don't mean any disrespect, if you don't mind, I'll just keep my feet up over here. Anyways, um, the topic that's been um, allotted to me is the hadith on the seven who will enjoy the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day when there will be no other shade provided apart from the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this hadith to me is extremely fascinating not only because of the immense rewards that are spoken of in the hadith, but what's most striking is the qualities that are discussed under each category of those who will enjoy the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oftentimes when we think about this hadith, we think about specific people, right? Imam Adilun, a just ruler. All right, I'm automatically out of that category. Just ruler, you know what, the biggest, the only ruler I know is the one I have in my book pack. That's a backpack, I got nothing else, that's my ruler over there. Shabun nasha fi ibadatillah, I don't know if I'm going to be worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we automatically take ourselves out of these categories. But it's important that when we go through this hadith, we look at each category not as a specific individual, but as indicative of a larger quality, of something that should resonate with a specialty that I may have in my life. And that will become a lot clearer as we go through the hadith, inshallah. The hadith begins with Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu saying that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sab'atun yudhilluhumu Allahu fi dhillih, yawma la dhilla illa dhillu. That seven fortunate individuals, seven people, seven categories of people will enjoy the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that scorching hot day when there will be no shade beside the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for us to understand the value of this hadith, if anybody lives in Dallas or even in Texas in general, you'll figure it out right away. It's extremely hot, it's about two o'clock, you need to cook, you need to get some groceries, you need to come back home, you go to Walmart, and it's extremely hot. Where do you park your car? 
You look for the perfect place where there may be some shade, maybe in a carport. You look for somewhere where when you come back, you don't, you're not going to be cooking your food inside of your car, right? You don't want it to be that hot. You look for shade, right? That's just human nature that when it's extremely hot, we go straight for shade. So this is a hadith that resonates with anybody who understands the concept of heat. That it's extremely hot outside, I'm going to make sure if I have work to do, I'm going to either do it after Maghrib, or I'm going to do it very early in the morning when it's not hot. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he says this hadith, he says, look, there are seven individuals, seven categories of people who will enjoy Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's shade on that day. Well, look, if you have any other category, any other quality, it's not going to help you. You need to be among these seven because even if you come early to Qiyamah, it won't help you because the shade is only going to be provided by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And before we proceed, we have to understand seven categories are mentioned over here, but a very famous scholar of hadith, Hafiz ibn Hajar, he mentions that it's seven in this hadith, but from other ahadith we learn of other categories as well. And I want you to bear in mind, inshallah, as we go through each of these categories, that we bear in mind not a specific individual, but a more deeper quality that is being discussed. Okay? Once we're done with all seven, we're going to come again, come, about, come again from behind and start the hadith again and try to understand it more holistically. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he begins and he says that from the seven categories, the first category is Imamun Adilun, a just ruler. So the first person to enjoy the shade of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala on that day when it's going to be scorching hot, people sweat it's going to reach until your elbows, until your knees, even until your mouth. That's how hot it's going to be. Now the question is, an imamun adilun, a just ruler, will be among those who will enjoy the shade on that day. What comes to mind when you think about a just ruler? Anybody want to give it, um, raise your hand inshallah if you have any thoughts. When you think about a just ruler, what comes to mind? Uh, no one is starving in the city, everyone is fed. Yes, everyone is fed in the city, everyone is fed. MashaAllah, that's good. Anything else? When you think about it, yes? He's not biased in his rulings. He's not biased in his ruling. Good, good, mashallah. Anybody else? When you think about Imam al a just ruler. Someone who's compassionate. Someone who's compassionate. All of these are correct answers. But the question is, when you think about Imam al who do you think of? Let me rephrase that question more specifically. Who do you think of when it is said a just ruler? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar radiallahu ta'ala an. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Salahuddin Ayyub. You think about these great figures in our history. Now, can I connect myself to that category? Most probably not, right? Like, when will I become a Salahuddin Ayyubi? Most probably, if I try, I'll find myself behind bars or something, right? Like, you know, the, like what's this guy even checking in Google, right? MashaAllah, Salahuddin Ayyubi, right? So, even if I wanted to be a Salahuddin Ayyubi, I can't, right? To, Aim for something so high, aim for something so you know, great, is kind of beyond my capacity. And that is exactly what I mean. This hadith is not speaking about specific individuals, it's speaking about a much deeper quality. And who can tell me what quality is being spoken of in this category? Anybody, when you think about a just ruler, is it the fact that it's by being a ruler you're going to be in that category? Or is it the quality of justice? What is it? It's the quality of justice. So although the Prophet ﷺ is speaking about a just ruler, he's trying to convey to you and I the importance of justice in general. Now, you may argue, why was the example of the just ruler given? Because that is a scenario where someone has the opportunity to abuse his or her right. Imagine someone is a leader, someone is a ruler, Nobody can say anything against them. It's so easy to have things go your way. Now, if somebody decides not to abuse their power and is just, then that is what you call in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exemplifying the quality of a just ruler. A perfect example. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala he's delivering the Friday sermon. And he's talking about the issue of marriage, He's talking about the issue of dowry. He's talking about the concept of mahr. And he says something. And one of the participants, one of the sahabiyat, one of the female sahabiyat, she hears this and she stands up. 
And in the middle of the khutbah, she stands up and she talks to Umar anhu and he says, Yabn al-Khattab, what are you saying? And he repeats himself. He says, this is what I am saying to the community. This is what I believe should be done. And then she says, what you're saying is wrong because it goes against a verse of the Qur'an. And then she actually quotes that verse of the Qur'an. What does Umar radiallahu anhu do? Listen, I'm the ruler. Shut up, sit down, stay quiet. You have no right to speak. Umar radiallahu anhu on the spot, he corrects himself and he says, you know what, you're right. I'm wrong. I am going to backtrack. That is Imam Adil. Imam Adil. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He, subhanAllah, he's with his family. It's the day of Eid. And now his children come to him and say, you know, Father, the clothes that we're wearing this Eid, they're the exact same clothes that we wore last Eid. You know, it's unfair. How come everybody else is allowed to wear new clothes and we don't have new clothes? He says, look, I have a particular stipend and that's all I'm going to use and this is what I can afford. I'm not going to misappropriate the public funds just so that you can wear some fancy clothes on Eid. That is Imam al But again, I don't want you guys to think of a specific category that until I don't become the Khalifa of the Muslim Ummah, I don't fall under this category. Well, that's never gonna happen, right? And if it does happen, there's gonna be a lot of problems if that happens, right? But that's not going to happen. We don't worry about being a just ruler. We talk about the concept of justice. MashaAllah, today we had a good conversation about the idea of justice. Like, how do I bring about justice in my community? Justice is of different levels, right? When I see something wrong, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, assist your brother when, or your sister, same applies over here, when he or she is both a dhalim and a maghloom. A dhalim and a maghloom. If they are being oppressed, or they are an oppressor. So the Sahaba, they said, okay, you know what? If my brother or sister is being oppressed, I kind of understand that. Somebody is oppressing them, someone's doing wrong to them. I'm going to intervene, I'm going to make a change and make sure they feel comfortable, right? But they said, Ya Rasulullah, what do you mean by help your brother when he's a ghalib? <coughs> if my brother or sister is an oppressor, how do I help them? Rather, I'm not supposed to help them, I'm supposed to stop them. So Nabi Wasallam said, that is exactly what it means to help them you stop them from committing their oppression. And oppression is a very heavy word. It can mean so many things, right? If I'm an elder sibling, and I'm literally taking my younger brother or sister's money, I'm oppressing someone. If I am a parent and I'm abusing my role or my right as a parent, I am committing oppression. If I, as a child, am not maintaining the due respect, again, I'm not talking about in cases of abuse or in cases of you know, very uh, exceptional circumstances. In a normal circumstance, if I'm not maintaining the rights of my parents, I am committing oppression. I need to understand, what does oppression mean? Linguistically, the word ظلم, ظلم oppression, in Arabic means to take something and place it where it does not belong. To take something and place it where it does not belong. My younger brother comes and he says, listen, I need help today at night. I have, you know, I got a really hard exam coming up. I need your help. I promise him 10 o'clock, I will be there. We're going to go through your coursework together. You're going to be ready for the exam. I'm dedicating my time to you. I give you my promise. Few hours before that, a few of my friends call me up and they're like, oh man, let's go outside. We need to do something. Let's meet up. Let's play a game. Let's watch a movie. Let's do something. And I tell my brother, you know what, uh, I can't meet you, I can't, that is ghul. I was meant to dedicate my time to him, or to my sister, to her, and I said no, then I have committed ghul. Imamun adilun, a just ruler. So if the just ruler is able to maintain justice in his or her capacity, then you and I could, should understand that we are rulers to an extent. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in an authentic hadith, he says, Kullukum ra'in. وَكُلُّكُمْ مَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَّتِهِ Each and every one of you, you're a shepherd and you have a flock. And on the day of judgment, you're going to be asked about your flock. So if I'm an employer, I have my employees, I have my flock. If I'm a parent, I have my children. If I'm an elder sibling, I have people beneath me. In whatever capacity I function, I have the right, I have the opportunity to exemplify justice. And that is what the first category is talking about. Imamun adilun. And that more specifically is talking about the quality of justice. The second quality. Shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. 
The second category of people who will enjoy the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who are they? Shab, youth, who spent their youth in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, let me ask you a question. When you think about youth, what age group do you think of? Anybody? When you think about youth, what age group do you think of? 12 to 20. 12 to 20? Good, mashallah. Anybody else? Something comes to your mind when you think about shab or shabab. I know what may come to your mind when you think about shabab. Don't think about that, but yeah. Um, 10 to 24. 10 to 24. Close, mashallah. Anybody else? 10 to 25. 10 to 25? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one year more. Let's include ourselves in time, right? All right. Shab, according to the commentators of hadith, what age group? From 15 to 30. This is youth. From the ages of 15 to 30. Now, if any of us here are like 60 years old or 70 years old, uh, I apologize, but khayr. Inshallah, you had your chance for being Shab. But <laughs> Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Shabun, from the ages of 15 to the age of 30. Age of, inshallah, your, your Shab fit in the heart, inshallah. That's what counts, right? <laughs> inshallah. So, um, from 15 to 30. And this is the most prime time, the most appreciated time in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the ages of 15 to 30, this is the time where people feel independent, where people feel I have the right to make my own choices, nobody should dictate what my life is supposed to look like. I mean, think about it. When we were young, right, when we're eight, when we're nine, when we're 10, when we're 11, right? Our parents tell us, go to the masjid, we're right there, we're going behind them. Our parents tell us to do something, we're doing it right away. We're so obedient because we don't really have much autonomy to do anything else. Now I'm a teenager, now I got my license, now I'm in college, now I graduate, I got a job, I'm making $4 an hour, I'm rich, right? I'm rich, I can do what I want. How dare you tell me what to do? I can provide for myself. And the dude goes, rents an apartment for two months and then comes back because it's too tough, right? So like, yeah, like I can make my own life decisions right now, right? It's that age where people are now feeling a lot more independent. Now, if a person decides to dedicate their time to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is so appreciated. It is so appreciated that the first person is the just ruler. Right after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messenger talks about that youth who sacrifices his or her youth for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean to sacrifice your youth? Now, that does not mean I spend my entire night praying salah. I spend my entire day reading the Quran. I spend my entire wealth just giving it in charity and I'll just sleep on the floor. I mean. If you do that, except the last part, inshallah, it's good, right? Like, please don't give all your money in charity and sleep on the streets, right? But what does it mean to do worship for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? There are two components. To do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands, but also to avoid those things which He has prohibited for me. What does that mean? For me, listen, I can't afford going for Hajj. For me, I can't be up every single night and pray to Hajjud. For me, listen, certain things are difficult for me. But I avoid things which are unlawful. Listen, you know what? My friends are going out to drink. I'm not going to go drink with them. My friends are going out to smoke. I'm not going to go smoke with them. My friends are going out to party. I'm not going to go party with them. I decide not to do that. Inshallah, we're going to be part of that category of Shabun Nash'a fi ibadatillah because this is something very subjective. What is worship for one person can be a completely different thing for someone else. They have a very famous statement in Arabic, Hasanatul Abraham, Sayyatul Muqarrabin. Right? To understand this in our terms, one man's or one person's tahajjud can be the same as another person just making it on time for salah. <coughs> Why? Because the sacrifices every person goes to is very different. My sacrifices, you guys don't know. Your sacrifices, I don't know. For some of our sisters to go do, you know, be dressed the way we're dressed. For some of the guys to break salah. For, for us to do certain things is very difficult, right? And I'll be honest with you, there are things that each and every one of us we have in our lives that is very challenging for us. For me to pray in front of people, for me to tell people that I'm a Muslim, for me not to drink, for me not to you know, intermingle or do things with the opposite gender, you know, it's very difficult for me. But I hold on to it because I feel that's my identity as a Muslim. That's very appreciated for, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
but yes, there are things which I cannot do. You know what, I'm still growing. Everybody's in that growth. But that period, if I'm able to make some sacrifices for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is extremely appreciated. It is extremely appreciated. And we have to understand that. Because sometimes we feel, oh man, Islam is a bunch of, you know, you know, a bunch of uh, like laws and regulations and things I can't do. But we have to understand whatever little we do do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates it. Shabun fi ibadatillah. If you study the Sahaba and Sahabiyat who really uplifted their deen, you'll be surprised. They were all under the age of 30 by the time the Prophet had passed away. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Umar. You look at some of the great companions, they were so young. Yet they had that zeal, that passion to you know, uplift the deen, uplift this religion. So shabun nasha fi ibadat layun. And I want you guys to really understand that whatever sacrifices you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in whatever capacity, Allah appreciates it. And inshallah, given how tough times are today, even if we may not do anything extra, but we just do not do what is wrong, I don't go partying, I don't go drinking, I don't you know, have haram relationships, I just avoid these things, inshallah, that's more than enough for me to be on the same level as the saints of the past. And I kid you not when I say that. Because it's so much easier to have been a saint in the past than to be just an ordinary Muslim today. Imagine, I go to class and people are mocking me for my name. People are mocking me for my worship. People are mocking me for the way I'm dressed. Right? I mean, look at me, right? Like, whenever I go outside, like, you know, I'm like the most visible, like, I'm as visible as a Muslim as you can be, right? I go outside, subhanAllah, you know, sometimes I ask myself, like, why do I do it? I say, you know what? Fair enough. I'm not saying that a person should be dressed like this. But if somebody says to me that, oh, you this or oh, you that, I add that as a feather to my cap. I'm like, I'm able to take something where I have been identified as a Muslim and I've been criticized for that. Now, I'm not trying to legitimize what's happening. But for me, you know what? This is a form of ibadah for me, a form of worship for me. And we all have to appreciate what we are doing. So, shabun nash'a fi ibadatillah, youth who are able to sacrifice for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the next person. وَرَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ That individual whose heart is attached to the masjid. And I know for many of you, this is a very sour topic. And I'll tell you why. Growing up, it was the same thing for me. Where you go to a masjid, right? You go to a masjid, you have a bunch of people who are of a particular demographic, a particular background, a mindset, a mentality. And I'm just an ordinary guy, ordinary girl. I come to the masjid and I get yelled at, I get screamed at, I get marginalized for things which I consider to be normal. Now, how do you expect me to have my heart connected to the masajid? Well, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger says, that person whose heart is attached to the masjid, not necessarily always the board of the masjid, or the people in the masjid, or the people running a masjid, because people will definitely have sour experiences. I'll give one example. I remember I was going for Umrah, and we were in Masjid Nabawi. And me and my wife, we were just sitting on the side, just relaxing, you know, just doing our adhkar, our qira'at, Qur'an, we're reciting. And we see a couple right next to us, we just start talking, they're from Canada. And uh, the wife, the, person, the husband, his, her, his wife, she was in tears. And I was asking like, what happened? She's like, you know what, I just tried to enter into the masjid and one of the guards, he was being so rough, he screamed at me, he pushed me to the side and he physically started, you know. He's like, I never want to come back to this masjid again. <coughs> and that really hurt me because I felt what this woman experienced is absolutely unjustifiable. But what that person did has resulted in her having a ne negative impression about the masjid. We're going to have these negative experiences. I can sit here and tell you 101 stories of negative experiences that I felt. But I should always feel my heart needs to be connected to the masjid. Because of the masjid, it is a garden from the gardens of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a garden from the gardens of Jannah. I can feel that I have that tranquility, that peace, that serenity when I am in the masjid. So, Another thing that's very important to bear in mind, although the word rajul is used, this hadith is not gender specific, right? It applies both to the male and the female. So, That individual whose heart is connected to masjid or masajid. Who here knows a bit of Arabic? 
Somebody want to tell me the difference between masjid and masajid? One is single and the other is plural. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ Which is plural. That person whose heart is connected to all of the masajid. Right? There's a lesson in this. It's kind of that community feel, right? You know, a lot of times we talk about community. We really think about just the few families surrounding the masjid. A community is not only the few families surrounding the masjid, uh, the masjid, it's every single Muslim on the face of this earth. That is my community. Now, I should feel equally comfortable going to another masjid as I feel comfortable coming to my masjid. Now, we all know that's somewhat of a fantasy. That's very difficult, right? We can't expect everyone to feel the same in every masjid. But we should understand this hadith speaking to you and I. That if I am in the masjid, I should make the experiences of other people so comfortable that they feel as though they are at home. If other people are not able to make my experience feel like I'm at home, I will make other people feel as though they are at home. You know, subhanAllah, I, I, it's interesting. So when I was um, uh, studying in South Africa, the first time I went there, it was like a culture shock to me. You know, like a random New Yorker, loud, you know, rude, no manners, nothing. I'm coming to South Africa, screaming about, doing my thing. And it was really interesting, right? So the first, first day when I came to the madrasa, the institution of learning, I go into the masjid, I come out of the masjid, just a normal day for me, right? And then fast forward like four or five years, one really close friend of mine, he was my friend for like a good four, four years, and he was a senior to me, he was ahead of me. And then he's graduating, he's about to leave, he meets me, and you know, you know, he's about to part ways, he's leaving, and I say, you know, mashallah, jazakallah khair, make dua for us, and everything. And I just had to ask him this one question, you know what, you were, you were a senior to me, yet this entire time you kind of took me under your wing. You helped me do my you know, homework, you helped me do my research, you helped me do everything. He's like, why? You know, like, why would you do it? There was nothing in it for you. He's like, oh, you didn't know? I'm like, oops, was I meant to say that? I don't want to ruin our relationship right before he leaves, right? And I'm like, oh, to be honest, I didn't know. I, you know, I thought you were just a really nice person. He's like, oh, okay, interesting. He's like, the first day I met you was in the masjid, and he was referring to the first day I came to madrasa. While I was entering the masjid, I didn't even realize. The first person who was walking out, I greeted him, I gave him salam, I asked him what's his name, and I asked him, can I do anything for you? I didn't even remember that exchange. I did not even, I hardly remember that exchange. Five years later, four years later, he's telling me, you know, that that's the only reason I'm your friend. I'm like, oh dang, I thought I was like cool or something, right? I'm like, I didn't know it was because I gave you salam. I'm like, all right, fair enough, right? So like, you can have these impacts on people in the masjid. And the masjid is that place where people come as like, you want to retire there, you want to feel comfortable, you want to feel welcomed, you want to feel, you know, I want to unwind in the masjid. So, رَجُلٌ قَلْبُهُ مُعَلَّقٌ بِالْمَسَاجِدِ That person whose heart is connected to the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The next person. وَرَجُلًا تَحَابَا فِي اللَّهِ اجْتَمَعَا عَلَيْهِ وَتَفَرَّقَ عَلَيْهِ Those two people who meet solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they part way solely for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You meet for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you part ways for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> when I think of this hadith, you know, subhanAllah, there's so many episodes from the life of the Messenger of Allah SAW that you can remember. In my opinion, one of the most, you know, for me, it was such a heartfelt, it was, it was so touching, this incident from the life of the Messenger of Allah SAW, where you meet someone for no ulterior motive besides the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the famous hadith of Jabir radiallahu anhu. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu ta'ala an was one of those companions who narrated the largest number of ahadith. His father, Abdullah ibn Amr, was martyred in the battle of Uhud. His father was martyred in the battle of Uhud. And he had many siblings. He had about like seven or nine sisters. So his father said, listen, I don't want you to come to the battle of Uhud. I want you to stay home and take care of your family. He's like, fine, I'll do that, I won't go. He doesn't get to go, his father is martyred. 
And this entire time, remember, the sole, you know, provider of the family passes away. You have so many siblings, and now all that burden comes onto your shoulder. So he's really stressed. But he says, you know what, the next opportunity I get, I will definitely participate in the next ghazwa, in the next battle with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. All right, the next battle comes, the battle of Dhatul Riqa'ah. The battle of Dhatul Muraysiyah. The battle happens, he goes out, he starts, you know, the whole battle happens, they're on their way back. <coughs> Jabir radiallahu anhu, he says, I'm on my camel, and the entire army is basically like miles ahead of me. My camel is so slow and so exhausted after the battle was over, every single person, mind you, every single person, even the foot soldiers, were way ahead of me and I'm just lagging behind. This entire time, I'm extremely frustrated. I'm like trying to urge my camel on, nothing is happening, the whole army is ahead. The Prophet Wasallam, he notices. He noticed this. He goes, remember, the Prophet is a general. He's all the way ahead of the army. He comes all the way in the back. He comes, he meets me, and he just starts talking to me. He starts talking to me. And he says, Jabir, how are you? He says, you know, Alhamdulillah, everything is fine, but I'm extremely frustrated. This camel of mine, you know, he's just like not going anywhere. So the Prophet he says, do you have a stick? He's like, um, <coughs> yeah, I have a stick. So he takes the stick and he taps the camel. The Prophet ﷺ, he recites a dua and he taps the camel. Jabir anhu says, the moment he ta taps that camel, I start holding on to the reins for fear that I'm going to fall off that camel. It starts going so fast. It's going so fast that now I'm ahead of the army. I'm ahead of the army. Everybody's like, whoa, where'd you come from, right? Like, what's going on? And this guy's like, I'm ahead of the, I'm ahead of the entire army. I'm trying to pull it back. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he quickly catches up to me, he's like, MashaAllah, what an amazing camel you have. And he's like, yeah, good question. I don't know where this happened from, right? I'm like, man, I need a few taps on my car as well. You know, that thing is like, yeah, anyways, it hardly made it to Austin. Anyways, right? Um, so, Nabi Sallallahu he's there with Jabir radiallahu ta'ala. And he says, you know, MashaAllah, now check this. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's asking, you know, how's everything going? How's your family? He's like, yeah, I know your father passed away. I hope everything's going well. Is there any way we can help? And he says, I'm so sorry, thank God it's not Juma Salah. Right? <laughs> Getting a phone call during Juma Salah. Um, so, yeah, Jabir radiallahu anhu, he's in the front of the army. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi comes, meets up with him, and now he starts talking. He's like, you know what, I heard that your father passed away. Um, you know what, can we do anything to help? Can we do anything to support you? And you know what, he took it like, he's like, yeah, mashallah, everything's going well. He's like, did you get married? Did you get married? And he says, uh, yeah, I did. I just got married right now. He's like, oh, maybe that's why you're going so fast. You know, Masha, just, you know, just joking around with him, speaking lightly. And then he's like, oh, did you get married? He's like, okay, who'd you get married to? And he said, look, I'm young. I had many options to get married to people, but I decided to get married to someone who was already previously married. I decided to get married to someone who was already previously married, who was a divorcee, someone who's a lot more older than me in age, but I decided this was the best course of action. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, why'd you make that decision? I'm curious. He says, I had many other siblings, and I thought even though marriage was one of the biggest life decisions I needed to make, I thought let me do something that perhaps would be good for me, but it would also be good for my family. Someone who can help me take care of my family as well, who will understand my family structure. You know what, I have a bit of an awkward scenario, maybe she'll understand me better. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you know, SubhanAllah, you have such vision, he started praising him. After that conversation was done, what does the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He says, Jabir, can I buy your camel from you? Jabir, can I buy your camel from you? And now Jabir is thinking like, man, if you bought it like 20 minutes ago, yeah, maybe. Right now when it's like a Lamborghini, mashallah, everybody's gonna wanna buy it, right? And then Jabir is like, can I buy the camel from you? And now he's like, oh man, what do I do, what do I do? And when he's narrating this to his students, he says, by the way, this was the only camel, not only that I had, but it was for the whole family. My whole family, we only had one camel, and this was the camel we used to get water. It was known as a nadih. Nadih is that camel that you used to get water as well. So it's our, like, everything, right? So now, he's like, okay, fair enough. How much you want to buy it for? 
Now the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said something which was somewhat uncharacteristic of him. He's like, I want to buy for one dirham. Imagine you come driving in here with your brand new Mercedes, right? And somebody's like, I want to buy that from you. How much? 50 bucks. <laughs> 50 bucks, I'll give you cash. I'll give you a mint $50 bill, right? And I won't even Venmo it to you, I'll give it to you in cash, right? You're like, are you crazy? And so, so you know, Jabir he felt a bit uncomfortable. He's like, Ya Rasulullah, I don't know, you know, this is a bit tough. Uh, maybe a bit more, and then he's like, all right, I won't give you one dirham, I'll give you two dirhams. I'll give you 50 bucks, I'll give you 100 bucks, final offer. And then Jack was like, okay, you know what, yeah, so I'll take it as a gift. You know what, I'll, I'll be generous, you can just take it as, I'm only getting like two dirhams anyway, might as well just give it as a gift. So he's like, you know what, just take it as a gift. So, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi was like, okay, you know what, I'll give you an uqiyah. Now Jabir al-Dilanu's eyes like open up, I'll give you $30,000, right? Like, yeah, if I have like a 1995 Mercedes, all right, fair, fair enough, go ahead, right? His eyes just open up and he's like, one uqiyah, done deal. Just act like that previous thing never happened, you know? I was never arguing with you, you can have it for an uqiyah. But then Jabir al-Dilanu says, can I just ask you a favor? You can take it for an uqiyah, but you know what, I have no other means of getting back to Medina. I have no other means, can I just ride it until I get back to Medina? You know what, Nabi Sallallahu says, fair enough. Fair enough, go ahead, ride the camel, take it back to Medina. So he's about to go and enter Medina when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, Ya Jabir, calm down, don't enter Medina yet. He's like, why Messenger of God? He says that the women folk that are in Medina, they have a right as well. If we're just gonna barge inside, they're not going to be prepared, it's unfair for them. We're gonna cap outside, spend the night outside, send word to them that we're coming, allow them to prepare, get ready, let them feel comfortable, and then we're gonna come. He said, fair enough. They do that, in the morning, Jabir radiallahu anhu, he takes his camel, last day, parting you know, moments, he comes home, he meets his wife, greets his wife, and he says to his wife, you know what, I got some bad news. And he's like, she says, what happened? He's like, you know, we only have one camel and I'm gonna have to sell it. She says to him so reassuringly that look, if the Messenger of Allah is engaging in a transaction with you, mark my words, it's gonna be for your better. Just trust me on this, it's gonna be better for you. He's like, you know what, I felt so encouraged by her words that I felt, you know what, I'm gonna go on with it. He steps out of the home and guess who he meets? He meets his uncle. And everybody knows your uncle is the last person you want to speak to about financial matters, right? <laughs> and he's like, oh, Jabir, how's everything? You're back from the battle, everything's good, mashallah. How's the camel doing? You know, how's the family camel? How's the family business? How's everything going? And he's like, oh yeah, about that, right? Uh, I got some bad news, I kind of sold it. He's like, what? You sold our camel? He's like, you sold our family business? What are, you, what are we gonna do? Right? We have no other source of getting water. So he's like, look, it was a message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I felt really uncomfortable saying no to him. What, you want, what, what do you want me to do? Stop acting like you're so tough. I bet if you were in my situation, at least I got an uqiyah, man. You would have gotten nine, you know? So he says, you know what? Fair enough. You sold it to him. You sold it to him. Fair and square. Don't go back on your word. Just go ahead and proceed with the transaction. So he goes to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he brings the camel and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I brought your camel, here you go. He says, Jabir, I want you to go to the masjid and pray Salah first. Pray Salah. He goes, he prays Salah, he comes out. In the meantime, he says to Bilal radiallahu anhu, Bilal, I want you to go and weigh the uqiya for him. Because I have to give him one uqiya, one amount of gold. I want you to weigh it and then give it to him. Right? I want you to weigh it and then give it to him. So Jabir and Bilal, they go outside. He begins to weigh that uqiya, the gold. And he not only gives him that amount, he gives him a little bit extra as well. And Jabir, he's like, listen, you gave me a bit extra. He's like, no, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told me that to give you an uqiya and give you a little bit extra as well. You know what? He says to be kind with you and fair with you. Good. He takes that amount. He's like, here's your al jamalu jamalu. Here you go, here's your camel, I'm out of here, I'm out. Takes his money, he's leaving, and he's thinking like, oh dear man, what do I do? I have an uqiya, man, I have to go buy another camel, is it gonna be the same camel? He's on his way out, when all of a sudden, he hears this call, Ya Jabir, ajib Rasulullah. Oh Jabir, the message of Allah Sallallahu is calling you. So he's like, I knew that extra amount wasn't gonna last for so much, right? Like, he gave me a bit, I, just, I knew it wasn't gonna last for too long, right? He's like, oh man, he's gonna take that amount back. So he goes back, 
And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is waiting there. And he meets him and he says, Jabir, how are you? He's like, good, yeah. He's a bit anxious too. He's like, I'm good, I'm fine. Let's get this meeting over with already so at least I know how much I have. And then the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is like, I have something to say to you. He's like, yeah, what is it? And he's like, Al Jamalu Jamaluk wa Thamalu Thamaluk. He's like, Jabir, the money, you keep it, take back the camel, it's also yours. Take back the camel, it's also yours. Jabal was like nearly broken to tears. The entire time the Messenger of Allah وسلم, just wanted to build a relationship with him. Just wanted to feel, you know, just have a light-hearted kind of experience with him. And eventually he says, you keep the uqiya, that gold, you keep the extra amount, and take back the camel as well, you can keep that as well. Jabir radiallahu anhu, he goes outside, he's ecstatic, he's so happy. The first person he meets, he just greets, grabs onto him, he says, you know what, I just came to you from the best human being I've ever met in my life. He's so touched by these words, he's so touched by the experience. And this is what it means, rajulani tahabba fillah. Two people who meet for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two people who meet for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This entire exchange, this entire interaction, what was in it for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He should have taken the camel. He never took the camel. He should have taken the money back. He didn't take the money back. He did it solely for the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Ijtama'a alayhi wa tafarraqa alayhi. You meet for the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and you separate for the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Anyways, we're talking about the seven people who will enjoy the shade of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The next group, right? Rajulun da'athu. When someone is called by someone of the opposite gender, and truth be told, the same thing applies even same gender nowadays, right? Like that's an issue that people face, right? It's it's definitely an issue that people face, right? Whatever the gender may be, when someone is called to engage in illicit behavior, immoral behavior. And it's not with any ordinary person, it's someone of good standing, someone of beauty. And he or she responds by saying, Inni akhafullah. I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anybody who goes to college will tell you this is perhaps one of the most difficult challenges you'll have as a Muslim in college. Learning how to control that desire. Learning how to control that gaze. Learning how to control yourself is perhaps the most difficult because there's no one supervising. I can do what I want. Listen, if I'm like 14 years old and I'm at home, God knows what parental controls are on my laptop. I have no idea what cameras are hidden in my room. I have no, like back in the days before cell phones, you had to make calls on actual landlines, right? You can literally hear your mom picking up the phone and listening to the conversation on the other end. Like, why is someone breathing on the other end of the phone, right? Anyway, so like, things are very different, right? But when you're, on your, when you're on your own, you're by yourself, right? You have so many opportunities to do what is wrong. And if somebody decides to say, Inni Allah, I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's a person who will enjoy the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want you to think about that. That look, if I'm in college, right, and I literally have nothing under my cap, I can't pray, I can't, I can't do anything, I can't read Quran. I, like, my life is, in, religiously speaking, it's somewhat in a mess, right? Let's just agree to that. Let's say perhaps my life is somewhat in a mess. But I hold on to this one thing, that I'll maintain my chastity, I can hope that this is enough for me to go to Jannah. Inshallah, if I have the correct intention. Because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, one person will be that person who's called to do that wrong deed and says, Inni akhafullah, I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we gotta understand, listen, it's not gonna happen that I'm gonna be walking down the street like in Walmart and some super <laughs> random like model is gonna be like, oh, hey, you come here, right? That's not gonna happen, right? Like, seriously speaking, that's not gonna happen. There's so many other ways that, like, you know, think about it, right? First of all, I gotta be true to myself. I'm not that great that, like, the whole world is gonna be lined up over there waiting for me, right? But we have to understand there's so many other opportunities for us to engage in this form of haram. How so? Messaging, right? SubhanAllah, the number of times what starts off as a very innocent like on a post spirals into something you look back and tell yourself, oh man, what did I just do? Oh man, what just happened? Like, seriously, like, we can fall under this category of inni akhafullah, inshallah, if we try to take some preventative measures from before. That I'm not, I'm gonna keep, look, look, reality is reality. We cannot expect to have complete 100% avoidance of one another. That's not gonna happen. But we have to learn 
that at certain point, if I feel this relationship with someone else is getting too close, too uncomfortable, that I may fall into something wrong, I need to ask myself, why am I friends? Why are we friends? Am I fr are we friends? Is it only homework? Is it literally only homework? Is it really homework? I need to ask myself, right? I don't know if any of you guys seen that video where like, why guys are friends with girls, right? And the guy, all the girls are like, yeah, mashallah, you know, they're friends and the guys are like, you know, just spilling the beans, right? Like, we're actually friends for this reason and that reason. And if those people know, they're like, what creeps, right? But we have to ask ourselves, like, there has to be a certain limitation in my relationship with someone else. That is it leading to something fundamentally wrong or not? And if I'm able to stop it right there and say, you know what, this relationship is going more than just a professional relationship, it's going beyond just being friends and it's something really uncomfortable, and I say, inni akhafullah, I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I'll be among those people who enjoy the shade. And this is a challenge for many people. Right, obviously if it's through halal means and eventually becomes halal, that's perfectly fine. But I need to ask myself, when I am with people, what is my intention? Do I have an ulterior motive in mind? Do I have a really you know, negative kind of outcome in mind? If so, I say, I fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I hold back and I resist, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make me among those people who will enjoy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's shape. I mean, I know we're short on time, I'm just gonna quickly, um, is somebody gonna call adhan or do we do it afterwards? Sorry? Yeah, because I was told that adhan will be called, or do I carry on and we'll call adhan later? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we can take a break. Okay, sure, we can take a quick break. Yeah, we need the shayateen to leave from here, right? All the shaytans. Allah! Akbar! Allah! Akbar! to come to the masjid. But the question is, if I'm already in the masjid, what's the benefit of hearing? Because the person is saying, Hayya ala salah, come to the prayer, come to the prayer. And then you respond by saying, La hawla wa la illa billah, I'm coming, I'm coming. 
But then the question is, if I'm already in the masjid, do I still need to respond to Hayya ala salah? Yes or no? So the scholars give a very interesting answer. They say, yes, you need to respond because the tawfiq of praying is very different of being in the masjid. Because you can be in the masjid and still not get that opportunity of praying. I can't explain to you how many times I've been in the masjid, adhan is called, and there's an emergency and I need to leave right away. So even when we say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, we're responding to the adhan because we ourselves need to fulfill the obligation of prayer. Nonetheless, um, there's just two more um, categories left, inshallah, we'll talk about them and then we'll open it up for some quick Q&A and then we can have some more uh, of an informal Q&A after um, the Isha Salah. So the last two categories are, category number one is رَجُلٌ تَصَدَّقَ The person who spends in charity with so much sincerity that the left hand doesn't even know what the right hand is spending. The left hand doesn't even know what the right hand is spending. And there are two qualities being discussed here. One is the sincerity, and one is also the concept of charity. And to talk about both of them is going to take a lot of time. I want to focus on the concept of sincerity, because it's somewhat relevant to us. How so? When we think about, um, when we think about sincerity, what do we think about, right? We think about, okay, you know what, when I'm coming to the masjid, I'll try to make sure nobody sees me when I'm praying, when I'm giving charity, I'll make sure nobody's looking at me. I mean, that's definitely there as well. But I want to talk about a specific problem before I address anybody else, it's to myself first and foremost. It's this culture of posting our entire life on social media. And I'm not saying that it is inherently evil or something, like it's completely wrong. There's nothing wrong with posting parts of your life on social media if that's what you're doing, that's perfectly fine. But when we can't consistently post everything that we do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on social media, then it's going to affect our sincerity. Right, like imagine, you know, I saw the, like just really, it's, it's a bit of a funny meme, but it speaks volumes about our circumstance, our situation right now. You have this picture of a person who, it's a cartoon, right? The guy, he's slaughtering the sheep for Udhiyyat, and he's taking a selfie, and the sheep is taking a selfie. You know, the sheep are taking a selfie of its final moment, right? And I'm like, it's just like how prevalent our situation is like, I literally cannot burp without letting people on Facebook know that I burped. 50 likes, wow, that's cool. Like, <laughs> I didn't know that, you know, people are gonna like that. But like, it really affects our ibadah. There are certain things that we need to do where literally nobody needs to know about it. Like, if I'm going for Umrah, if I'm doing tawaf, if I'm reading Quran, if I gave charity, there has to be certain things in my life. Look, certain things that I do and I post, definitely it's going to affect other people and they're going to be encouraged as well. Right, so I'm reading Quran and I post about it. MashaAllah, that's great, other people are gonna feel inspired. But there are gonna be occasions where I have to ask myself like, listen, I did a khatam of a Quran, let me just not tell anybody this time and just keep it between myself and my creator. There are incidents, Abu Bakr, uh, Ibn Abid Dunya, he says that some people had so much sincerity in their repentance that they would be lying on their beds with their spouses beside them and they would be weeping to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and crying without their spouses even knowing about it. Right? Imagine. Like, no, nobody knows about what we're doing. And I just, I'm, again, I'm not talking to anybody else here beside myself. Like, I need to ask myself, like, every time I do something, do I really need to let the world know? Or can I do a few things in my life which literally nobody knows besides myself and my creator? You know, it's really interesting. When I was, um, when I used to live in New York, the local masjid, it, we didn't have any janitor there, anybody to take care of it, so the local brothers would just clean up the masjid. And I remember once, I came back very late. We went for a program, we came back very late to the masjid. It was way past Isha Salah. I come downstairs and I see a local brother cleaning up the toilets. And it really struck me, and he got scared. He like dropped them off and acted like he's just there walking about doing his work. Like, seriously, like, why would a person randomly be wandering around like at 10 o'clock at night in the bathroom? Like, okay, I got the point. You know, like, mashallah, you're, you got security, right? But like, so he was, he didn't want anybody to know. And like the moment he saw me, he tried to like act like he's doing something else. Now that's sincerity, like nobody knows about it. And cleaning the bathroom, like seriously, like, I, like some of us wouldn't even, I, 
including myself, I wouldn't do it even if I was paid to do it, right? Like, you don't want to clean up the, it's really tough, right? But he was doing it all for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he realized somebody was watching him, in whatever you know, way he did it, he tried to act like he wasn't doing that either. We should have certain things in our lives that we do that literally nobody knows besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that brings us to the last category. رَجُلٌ ذَكَرَ اللَّهَ خَالِيًا فَثَابَتْ عَيْنًا That person who is with Allah subhanahu who, who remembers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and they begin to weep. They begin to cry. Look, a serious question for all of us here. Let's ask ourselves this. When was the last time I cried in my prayer? Not in my salah, in my dua. When was the last time I shed a single tear? I'll be honest with you, I have to ask myself, when was the last time I shed a tear? And the answer is, it's been a long time, unless like somebody passes away, or there's like a tragic incident, we generally don't cry about these things, right? We, our hearts have become so hard, our hearts have become so accustomed to everything besides crying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So that person who cries remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and with nobody around. You know that whole idea of, you know how we fast from social media? It's kind of like that, where we take like a few days off, away from our phones, away from everything. You're like, what a hypocrite, guy has his phone on his, in his pocket, right? Like, why are you talking, right? But like, no, we need to work towards that. Like, how we are able to put technology aside for an entire day, or some moments of the day, and just do dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Literally sit in the corner, read Quran, do adhkar, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cry, shed a tear. And that is so precious in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I, I just wanna leave you guys with this before we open up for Q&A. Like, let me ask myself this question. When was the last time I cried in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And if the answer is I can't remember ever crying in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I should be, it should be known to me that my life is really, really far from the life of the Prophet Because the one thing about him was, he used to cry at every given moment. He used to cry all the time. And SubhanAllah, the Sahaba used to cry as well. Like, cry for what? Though you may wonder like, why cry? Cry because we think of our shortcomings. We think about the blessings of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We humble ourselves before the Divine. Umar radiallahu anhu, he comes to the gathering. He sees the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam crying. He sees Abu Bakr Radiallahu Anhu crying. He doesn't know why they're crying. He's like, Ya Rasulullah, tell me why you're crying and I'll start crying. Even if I don't understand why, I'll pretend to cry. If, I don't know why, but I'll cry. That was the culture at that time where you humble yourself before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. <laughs> Nonetheless, these are the seven categories of people who are gonna enjoy the shade of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala on that day. And there's so much to talk about. To recap it, we really don't have time. But I want you guys to think of each category, not as an individual, but as a category that exemplifies equality. Imam al talks about justice. Shab bun fi ibadatillah talks about the preciousness of youth. Rajulun qalbuhum bil mu'allakum bil masajid talks about the concept of having your heart attached to the masjid. Two people loving one another for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sacrifice. You know, saying no to someone who's calling you to something unlawful talks about controlling the desire. Charity and sincerity talk about not showing off in ostentation. Crying in, you know, alone before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about how we can soften our hearts. So the one lesson that hopefully we can take from all of this is if I cannot be part of every single category, Hopefully tonight, inshallah, and I implore everyone, and including myself, let's look at one quality that may be good for me, and I'll hold on to that quality and hope for that to be my ticket to Jannah. If it's justice that I'm good at, I'm gonna pursue justice. If it's my ability to control and protect my chastity, that's what I'm going to do. If it's charity, that's what I'm going to pursue. If it is crying before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's what I'm going to do. Anyways, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to practice on this hadith May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us among those who will enjoy his shade on that day where there will be no shade beside the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, I think we have 15 more minutes left before salah. Uh, we'll answer some formal Q&A right now. And again, inshallah, after salah, we'll have Q&A again. Inshallah. Um, also, we have a Q&A form on GroupMe. 
you guys uh, took this fight, and I don't think they also posted on Sisters Mafia. So if you want to do your questions anonymously. What was that? Um, the, we gave an anonymous Q&A on the um, Texas Fight group chat on GroupMe, and also on Sisters Mafia, I think. And any sisters aren't on the group chat would want the Q&A for Um, here's the question. Uh, you said that protecting your chastity will get you to Jannah. What if I had a past illicit relationship but have since established the that have stayed chaste since? There's a hadith where the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu says, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud recounts this. It's from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud where he says, A person who sincerely seeks tawbah and repentance, it is as though that person never committed the sin to begin with. So yes, if I did have a past, and I've repented from that past, and I've kind of, you know, now I'm protecting my chastity, definitely that person will fall under that category. Does crying for Rasulullah Sallallahu and his Ahlul Bayt count as crying in front of Allah? When we say crying for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and Ahlul Bayt, it would mean, what do, what do we mean by that? If we cry out of compassion, out of love for the sacrifices that they made, out of you know some of the contributions they made for Islam, definitely that is something noteworthy. But to be very specific, this hadith talks about a person who contemplates over their own shortcomings and feels somewhat ashamed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sheds a tear for that. But definitely crying for the Messenger of Allah and his family and the contributions that they made is definitely noteworthy. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, yes, anybody want to ask a question? Yes. Um, if I was like married, I would have like a wife and kids to take care of. That would be like my flock, and I would be like a shepherd. But, like as a student, like what would be my um, flock right now? So, when one way of okay, sorry. Yeah. So the question is, we understand the idea of having a flock if you are running a family. So I have kids, I have a spouse, I have a family to take care of, so that's my flock over there. What's my flock if I am like a single person, independent? So the hadith talks about another example is that man who has his parents, has his siblings, has someone that is somewhat related to him and he or she has some financial responsibility in that regard. So for a child, uh, that his flock or her flock would be taking care of and maintaining the responsibility of the, of the family. So in what, for some people it's more serious and for other people it's a lot, it's less serious. So let's say for instance, I just happen to be in charge of some youth club. So that's my flock. I mean, telling them that would be really awkward, like you are my flock, right? Like, but just conceptualize it in that way that you have a degree of authority over them and you need to uh, respect that, right? How to get a... Okay, you know what, just to skip that question. Okay, the question is... It's a really interesting question. How do I get married? Uh, Angel, that's not exactly what it says. I'm just going to censor the exact question. I'll just assume that that word is, is an acronym. It's not, right? Okay, next question. Okay. Um, anybody? Do you have a question? Yes. Oh, you want to answer the question? Yeah. All right, mashallah. <laughs> Okay, the question is, I, as 
not you, but I, as, as a single male Muslim brother in the masjid, I need to make everyone feel accommodated. Now, how do I make my sisters feel accommodated at the same time maintaining a necessary boundary without making anybody feel creeped out or really awkward? Like, you don't want to go up to Assalamu Alaikum, Sister House, and think, like, I want to make this the best experience you're going to ever have in the masjid. That's the last time that person's ever going to come back to the masjid, right? Just put it that way. Look, this hadith means, let's make means for them, right? Let's say, for instance, a sister comes to the masjid and complains that, look, the back section always stinks and smells really bad. So I will make it a point to go and clean it up and accommodate for them. There's that way as well, not the first scenario, there's this scenario as well, right? Also, like, listen to their opinions. Go like, okay, you know what? What would make you feel more comfortable and I will try to facilitate, facilitate that. But it's important to realize there's also certain boundaries, right? I'm not going to go and do certain things which are wrong for me to do to now and make feel people feel accommodated. Within the shari'i boundaries, I'll make that person feel accommodated. So for instance, I will keep some, you know, some fruits available for people. When they come inside, they'll have something to eat. Or when they leave, they'll, excuse me, there'll be something, there'll be like, um, like a, I don't know, like a, like a local community WhatsApp group where people will be able to voice their concerns and I'll try to facilitate those concerns being addressed. But yes, you're right, there are certain boundaries that I need to maintain. It's not just, you know what, I'm gonna make everyone's experience feel very comfortable here, which can be very creepy and weird, right? Yeah. You don't wanna be that person, right? I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> MashaAllah. Does that, does, that, does that answer your question? You get the point, right? Yeah. All right, any other questions? Yes? Um, so you made the point of talking about how whenever we're faced with those changes in new we kind of like abstain from it, but it's more of like a specific hypothetical scenario, assuming that you are going with friends and they're the type to like drink alcohol, yeah. and you basically go to a restaurant together, and obviously you wouldn't order that. So if you're constantly around people that would be like, in this scenario, around alcohol at times, but you don't actively engage in the consumption of alcohol, even if it's like at a hotel room, so to speak, would that be okay, or is that still like too? So important? there is a hadith that says you should not be on that same table where alcohol is consumed because you don't want to be part of that culture. <coughs> yes, in some. Oh, sorry. The question. Yeah. I'll remember that step. Question is, um, you know what? If I'm out with friends and I'm always with them consistently, and they happen to drink alcohol, but I personally do not drink, is it fine for me to just be with them even though I don't order that drink? Now. If this happens consistently, it's definitely unacceptable Islamically. But sometimes what happens is I have like a you know like a work meeting and it's just a one off and I'm gonna do my best but these I'm forced to be there. I will do it and I'll seek the and it's still fun from doing that, but that's fine, maybe one off if it just happens. But to make it a habit is it's not right. Right? You don't wanna be part of something where you know you're you're, you're gonna be like a shahid, a witness to something that is unacceptable. Yes. So um, my question is, if you're requesting that all those seven categories, you basically strive really hard to like make one of those, but you can't. If you make dua to Allah, that Ya Allah, I can't make these seven categories, please shave me up today, there's no new energy. What's the, uh, I mean Allah answers that you do have a you If you don't fall into those categories, because you try too hard, how's it? Good question. The question is, let's say I'm trying to fall under one of the categories. I'm trying to control my chastity. I'm trying to be just. I'm trying to give in charity. I'm trying my sincerity. I'm trying all these things, but it's just not working out. Can I make dua that Ya Allah make me among them? If a person does anything in Islam with sincerity, and they're not able to fully achieve that goal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will raise them among those people. It's clear from the hadith. There's a hadith the authenticity of which we can discuss, but it does come in a book by Ibn Shaheen where he talks about the people who are memorizing the Qur'an. And they're memorizing the Qur'an and they pass away before completing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will appoint someone who will facilitate for them to be among the Hufad when they raise among the people on the Day of Judgment. So based on that, yes, if a person is sincerely trying and isn't able to fully maintain it, they will be under that category. I think he has a better response, inshallah, right? <laughs> inshallah. Uh, yes? Um, I had a question about like, the fourth one, which was being uh, for the pleasure of Allah. And you were saying how like, it should be completely that. Um, is it like, 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 how do you define that, right? Like, how do you define um, 
you're meeting this person, like friend or whatever, just for like the sake of Allah rather than like, um, you both enjoy coming to the masjid, something yeah. like that. So in the end of the, okay, question, question, I got that question. So the question is, um, you mentioned that Rajulan tahabba fila, two people who love each other for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do you define that? Yes, all intentions somewhat have ulterior motives here and there, but if the reason I'm driven towards that thing is for the pleasure of Allah. So an example would be, I have friends who I will meet up with in the masjid. Now, when I'm going to the masjid, if it's purely to go to the masjid and I just happen to meet them as well, will that be an example of meeting for the pleasure of Allah? Yes. But if, for instance, I just hug my friend, and I'm just holding on to him, I don't know why, but I'm just doing it anyway. I want to be creepy, and I just want to do that. Will that be considered for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Absolutely not, because I'm showing off, right? <laughs> Obviously not. I'll, I'll, I wouldn't even fall under that last category. So the point is, if I am doing it, so let's take a hypothetical scenario. We come for the masjid, we come for Salat al Aisha every single day. Now, I come to the masjid, my purpose is, I'm coming to the masjid, afterwards I'm going to meet my friends. If I want to meet them because I want to discuss some work-related stuff, I want to talk about some uh, you know, school-related stuff, that's not necessarily meeting for the pleasure of Allah because I primarily came to the masjid for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I happen to meet them. Whereas if I say to my friends, you know what, we're going to have a youth halaqa, let's all come together and meet. That is for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, there'll be some pizza afterwards, there'll be some, hopefully, inshallah, there's pizza, right? Yes, there'll be pizza afterwards, but we're doing it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there happens to be some other intention involved, not that it's wrong, because it's somewhat unavoidable. How can I purely, purely meet only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But if the driving force, that I'm going to the masjid, I said to my friend that, you know what, I'm going to meet you after that. You know what, let's talk. You're, having, you're struggling with your faith, I'm going to talk to you about it. You need some advice, I'm going to talk to you about it. That's for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes? I have a question. Um, so what I've heard is that if we are in this setting, and you'll have like angels kind of also attending and they'll kind of, I don't know, they'll ladder up to the sky and all that. But if, what if like someone is listening to that podcast like, you know, at home? Yeah. Is that going to be applicable as well? So the hadith, the question is, I heard that when there's a gathering, the angels surround that gathering and they gather to the point that they reach the heavens. Will that apply to people who are listening it through live stream? The answer to that is, the reward is not necessarily for the talk, the reward is for the gathering. And the gathering is when you're physically present over there. Now I'm not saying that they're bereft of any reward, but the angels are hafathumul malaika. They encompass that particular gathering. Inshallah they may get that reward, but it's not directly applicable to them. You just, I think there's a question there. I don't, um, I don't enjoy my life. <laughs> I need to figure out if the guy is trolling me or not first, right? Um, okay, I don't enjoy my life, have no close friends, and am too unattractive to find a potential wife. What is, what in Islam can make me happy regardless? It can be a serious question. I think that's why you guys are making it so tough for that person. If you're going to laugh at his question like this, <laughs> then he'll never, um, yeah. Anyways, uh, I don't enjoy my life. So, look. Definitely, Islam provides a meaningful life, provides fulfillment, right? But I need to ask myself, if some of the challenges that I'm facing, why is that? Okay, so I don't enjoy my life. I have to ask myself, why don't I enjoy my life? If I don't have friends, I have to ask myself, why I don't have friends? If I don't have a spouse, I have to ask myself, why I don't have a spouse? Now, expecting me not doing anything in that regard, and somehow Islam is going to be this magic pill that I'm going to eat and make my life perfectly fine, it's not going to happen, right? I'm not saying that people struggle and that Islam is not a solution to that. Definitely Islam is a solution to that, but I need to realize how I can bring about a change in my life. If there are problems in my life, I have to really deal with the problems face on, head on. Like, you know what, this is something which I will deal with. I can't just bury my head in the ground and expect my problems to get resolved. But to answer the question, if I'm understanding it more correctly, is in like, what can I do to get some contentment to maybe improve my life? Then there are many things, right? Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reciting the Quran, prayer, connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, connect with the Muslim community, connect with your brothers and sisters in a way that's meaningful, 
right? Doing all of that, inshallah, can eventually lead to something more productive, more, excuse me, more fulfilling, inshallah. Yes, you had a question. So yes. last question. Man. Last question. We're going to carry on, inshallah, again after uh, salah. So hopefully uh, we'll have more Q&A then. Yes. Okay, so really fast. The question is, why do you actually, uh, I guess in general, so there's a lot of this, so the five pillars of Islam, so the five pillars of Islam, yeah. so that's the laws of God and all of that. Why, why does the hadith not mention those things and those people being protected as well? So to understand, the, so question again, why is it that there's a great emphasis on the five <laughs> pillars of Islam, but this hadith doesn't talk about the five pillars of Islam? So why speak about a completely different category? The reason for that is there's a principle of hadith, a, it's a method of speech of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, where he gives special emphasis to certain things that necessarily does not mean that they're better than any other category, but just to emphasize the importance of those qualities. So for instance, does it mean that these seven categories are greater or better or it's more important than the five pillars of Islam? No, not at all. But to emphasize these seven categories, they have a very special reward for it. To give an analogy, we know that there are several gates to Jannah. There are several gates to Jannah. But that person who fasts will go through Babu Rayyan, a specific gate for that person who fasts. Well, the person who does all of these other deeds should be able to go through that door as well. That person has their rewards. That person has his or her rewards. This is a special reward which does not undermine that other person's reward, at the same time giving something special to this person. Does that answer your question? So these seven categories of people will have that special status, but that does not undermine the special status of the five pillars. <laughs> So like everybody, um, just two quick announcements. Um, first one is, um, there's like a sister trying to get out and there's a white Nissan Altima um, truck and a maroon Honda, so if you guys could quickly um, uh, do that. Also, just a, another general note, um, when people are asking questions, um, like you know, whether just giving them the benefit of the doubt that they're serious and try not to laugh, it might be a serious question. Thank you.